you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. One of the country's haunted histories I've yet to dive into is the beautiful and historic nation of Wales. With centuries of legends, more castles than you can fire a catapult at, and some notable hauntings, Wales is a country dear to my childhood. Many summer holidays were spent in the north of the country, and so it's a long overdue return visit to the haunted history of Cymru. Author and journalist Mark Rees is our guide to some of the more notable paranormal hotspots as we discuss a couple of my favourite poltergeist cases from Britain, a trio of extremely haunted public houses, a castle spectre or two, and the rather remarkable true story of Adelina Patti, one of the 19th century's most famous opera singers ever. Mark certainly takes us to some amazing locations that you won't be disappointed by. Before that, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters or clicking on the link in the show notes. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also find Mysteries and Monsters on all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and you can also subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also find us at mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes, updates, and merchandise by clicking the link at the top of the page. As always, thank you to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is of course produced by Brennan Store of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So in the month of St David, where better to go hunting some Welsh ghosts than in the company of Mark Rees? March in the UK starts with St David's Day, the patron saint of Wales, with celebrations, parades and special disses to celebrate the only native-born patron saint of Britain and Ireland. As one can expect, this beautiful and historic country is also home to some of the UK's most haunted places. Joining me to discuss some of these wonderful locations and stories is author, journalist and the host of the marvellous Ghosts and Folklore of Wales, Mark Rees. Mark, welcome to Mysteries and Monsters, sir. Hello, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. And happy St. David's Day, I guess. Or Deeth Goil Dewi Sand, as we say, uh, using the local lingo in this part of the world. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yes, and the very same to you and yours. Um, Wales is a place, Mark, as we were chatting before we started the interview proper, that is very close to my heart. And to my shame, I have left it unattended for too long. I often used to holiday in Wales as a child, so it's it's somewhere that I've often found full of beautiful coastline, friendly people, and, and stunning vistas across the country. Um, as a native-born Welshman uh, and someone that's clearly very proud of their of their home, you seem to have built a real reputation over the last sort of 15, 20 years as, as being extremely proud, but also deeply interested in the weird and wonderful parts of Wales. Yeah, yes, well, thank you for saying so. Yes, yes. And the, um, I should say, I mean, you've painted this lovely romantic image of Wales there with these flowing landscapes and things. At the same time, where I'm living is, is a very industrial park. So, you know, it's much like other places we have these, uh, <laughs> these different areas. And it, in fact, I imagine my, my part of Wales probably shares more with, with, with Sheffield, both being steel towns mm. than with the uh, mountains of, of Snowdonia. <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I have. I've carved out this this little niche, um, which what what wasn't planned. It's it's a it's a lovely it's a lovely coincidence. And I think it's just it's the magic of the internet nowadays, isn't it? But by by talking about things that you're passionate about, you, you discover there are other people out there who also are interested in, in these things. Um, and and word spreads. And yes, you know, I've, I've been very lucky that you know for, for some mad reason people want to listen to my podcast, want to read my books. And it's helped me to continue, to continue what I'm doing. So long may it last. Absolutely. And I, I think, personally speaking, Mark, out of the the countries that make up the United Kingdom or the British Isles and Ireland, 
I think Wales often gets overlooked for some reason. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's because you guys don't shout about things as much as the rest of us do here, or some of your wonderful haunted locations. And yet, Wales has such a rich history of myth and legend and folklore and the paranormal that I'm still very surprised that more people don't know more about more notable cases in in regards to the Welsh history of the paranormal. Um, And your books are a fabulous guide to anybody who may not know much about Wales's haunted histories. Um, Your wonderful Victorian archive book is one of those little collections that I think always gives us a real insight to to the history of a country or or a specific area, because it shows us that these kind of things have been going on for a lot longer than, than the modern era, because I think often, and I'm sure we'll touch on one of these particular locations later in our chat, it seems that certain places get notorious more often due to YouTube and podcasts promoting specific areas, whereas when you look at your body of work, there are numerous accounts that go back nearly 200 years from the country. Yes, I mean, I think you've taken the words out of my mouth there where you said earlier that we don't shout about it enough. Uh, And and that's true. I mean, I was doing an interview um, yesterday, in fact, with somebody to promote my new book, which I'm sure I will shoehorn into this conversation at some point. (laughs) Uh, And and I mentioned the fact that there are there's so many sort of big screen things out there. Never mind YouTube. You've got things like Game of Thrones and, and The Witcher, which is huge now and things. Lord of the Rings films which can all find some influence in them, which, which can be you know, sort of traced back to Welsh mythology from, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. Mm. And it's something that Wales as a, as a country isn't aware of. It's, it's not a case of other people ignoring us. <laughs> we ourselves don't know about it and don't shout about it. And I think that's something we need to take upon. And you, you mentioned the, the, the Ghosts of Wales, the, the Victorian Archives book that I wrote. I mean, that, that is something that, I discovered because I myself didn't know these stories existed. When I think of Victorian ghost stories, I think of Dickensian London. You know, I think I think of Charles Dickens, the, these sort of Scrooge type ghosts. Mm. And I don't know. if Oh, I, I didn't. I should say I didn't know of any in Wales. So I say I set myself this little mission, really, because I, I'm, I'm a journalist by trade. So I've got access to these these old archives and these old newspaper clip in rooms and things. Mm. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to go and look in these and to see, you know, if there are any old Victorian Welsh ghost stories? And what I discovered was, you know, it wasn't just one. There were hundreds of the things that nobody had written about. Nobody had spoken about since, as far as I know, the 19th century. So in some cases, it's it's just about really being curious, which I, I think is is important, not, not just for ghost books, but, but for life, really. Just just be curious and see what's out there. And it's amazing what you'll find. And um if, if you're lucky like me, th- those those ideas, being curious, will lead to lead to a book, which which is how the Ghosts of Wales uh, Victorian book came about. Yeah, and I think one of the positives of the modern sort of embracing of of things like YouTube and the internet is that I think it's often opened up areas and subjects to a far wider audience than we could ever expect. Um, People are are able to have access to newspaper reports and newspapers from from areas and and places and centuries ago now that when you're based in a local area, you only usually had your local archive mark. And I think it's given people a bigger pool of information to kind of dive into. And, And often you can basically find anything from anywhere in the modern era nowadays, it seems, by by looking on YouTube, because there are hundreds of channels on YouTube that upload archive interviews and historic documentaries that perhaps for many of us would have been lost for time in the days when even when we didn't have video recorders. Yes, we, you've almost got the opposite problem now. There's all, it's, it's almost <laughs> gone from nothing to everything, isn't it? Um, and p- part of the challenge, really, with, with, with going through these archives now is actually... In the old days, it was trying to find something. Now it's trying to decide what's, what stuff to chuck out. And, it, you know, it's amazing how many stories don't get out there because it's just it's it, it's overwhelming. If, if you sort of take in every ghost story ever written about in every newspaper in the entire world. Um, and so, yes, it's 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 the pros and cons now. But uh, one of the toughest parts of, of doing these things now is is deciding what what doesn't make the cut anymore and what uh, what to leave out, really. But it's it's nice that. 
when things do break through, I mean, a, re- a really good example from Wales is the, the Mary Lloyd. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with this tradition now. Yes. Of It's the horse's skull that is carried around at Christmas time. Mm. And th- this is another good example of something that wasn't, I mean, it wasn't widely known in Wales, never mind in other places. <laughs> and thanks, thanks to social media and YouTube videos and things showing people what it's like. You know, I, I was talking to someone in Chicago this Christmas who had their own Ma- Mary Lloyd party out there running around America <laughs> with a horse's skull on a stick because they'd seen these crazy Welsh people do it on the Internet. And so, you know, it's, it's great. It's great when it sort of um, reinvents itself, you know, in a way like that and car- keeps it going. Um, and, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, that can happen to some of the other tra- traditions because there's so many other traditions out there. It is just a case now of, of sifting through them and having having the good ones come come through again. Yeah, I think. Murray Lloyd is is one of those traditions that I think Krampus has opened the gateway to people looking into the darker side of of Christmas and New Year, Mark. And I think the Murray Lloyd is one of those that seems to have really been re-energised, especially as you say, it seems to have been reduced to a very local tradition in a specific area of Wales. And over the last sort of 10 or 15 years, it's, I would imagine it's probably grown throughout so has that has that has it seen itself sort of become re-established in wales and and is beginning to build a reputation because as you say i would suspect that for lots of people growing up in wales they probably weren't aware of this tradition until social media and and the love of the darker side of christmas seems to have brought it to the fore that that, that's right i I think i think you're spot on with with characters like krampus people do like the the darker side of these traditions and the things that you know it was a sound of a dinosaur, but in the pre-internet times, you know, you, you probably wouldn't have known about these things. You wouldn't have been exposed to them, and now you can be. I mean, for for, for me, um, I, I I think I'm quite lucky. Other people might disagree and say it's the opposite. But I was <laughs> in Welsh language education growing up, so all, all of my school lessons, I was taught in Welsh, and as a result, you, you get a different you get a different spin really on the 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 culture on on the old stories and the old traditions. And something like the Mary Lloyd was something I spoke about in school. Uh, we, we also spoke about things like Norse Kalangaya, which is the Welsh equivalent of Halloween, mm-hmm. and, and tales like the Mabinogion and the old Arthurian tales. The, these books were all, you know, they, they were around me. They were in the school library. There were posters up for these things. And for me growing up, this was, you know, perfectly normal. It was just, you know, it's just a part of my culture. What I didn't realize is that even for, you know, a lot of people in Wales didn't have that same education, that same upbringing. And it's, it's only now, again, thanks to the internet, internet, that I'm discovering that to a lot of people, you know, that this stuff, which is, you know, b- boring old kid stuff to me, is actually new and exciting stuff to a lot of people out there. <laughs> so it, it is giving me a chance for it. It's kind of, uh, like I said, it's, it's something I'm passionate about, and it's great that I can I- expose other people to it now in a, in a roundabout way. Yeah. So what was it about the paranormal history and folklore of Wales that attracted you, Mark? Because obviously, as, as we mentioned in the introduction, you're a journalist by trade. And as you say, it, you've you've carved an, a, a wonderful niche out in the modern era of, of delving into these subjects. So often people either gravitate to these subjects because they have a deep interest in it or it's personal experience of some kind. What was it for you? It's a bit of both. And what what really helped me is, and there's a, there's a little tip here for any budding journalists, but it's about being crafty with your profession as well, because I think what a lot of people do with journalism is, you know, they say things like, you know, I'd love to be a football journalist. I'd love to be a fashion journalist or whatever, whatever they're interested in. Mm. And really what you have to do is to just get your foot in the door and to say, look, I'll just write about any old rubbish, whatever you want. Just, <laughs> just let me in, pay me money to do this. Right. <laughs> but then once you're in there, you can kind of pick and choose things then that kind of, you know, you're, you're a little bit more interested in and work towards your niche. Now, in my case, over the years, I ended up becoming the bloke who every Halloween would write, you know, you know, these kind of top 10 most haunted places in Wales yeah. or, you know, wh- wherever, you know, it might be the top five spookiest restaurants in Sheffield, say, or wh- wherever, wherever <laughs> you are in the country, yeah. newspapers like to churn out these lists. And I, I was the bloke doing that again and again. And I thought, well, you know, we're doing the same old, you know, repeating the same old stuff again and again. And it's something I'm, I'm quite passionate about. And it's something I'd like to do something different with. Mm. And as a journalist, it gives you the, the opportunity to actually to go and speak to people and to do things that, other people might not be lucky enough to do so. For, you know, for example, if there's a supposed haunted castle, if you phone up that castle and say, hello, can I come and spend the night in your castle and look for ghosts? 
they're either going to laugh at you or charge you 500 pound. Otherwise, you're not going to get in there. But as a journalist, in return, you know, for a nice article, you get access to these places. And the internet, internet again, really opened things up here because things like video, mm. video is worth more than a million words now. And if you can go to that castle, do some filming and share it with the world, everyone's happy. The venue are happy. They're getting lots of lovely exposure in the press. I'm happy because I get to write about what I like writing about. And hopefully the readers are happy because they're getting given something new. They're not getting rehashes of the same old rubbish. They're getting something new, which, which wasn't out there before. And ideally, that, that's been my, my plan, really, of, of combining my, my passion for the paranormal and the supernatural with my, my profession. And it, it spilled over into books in my case, luckily, because, you know, I, I used my initiative and I found all this great research, you know, I touched upon in, in, in the archives that I could use. Um, but yeah, it's, it's almost, um, I, you know, I, I've used the word lucky a few times. I, I think I've just been very lucky really that, that I've been able to, um, I've been in a position, I've been able to do this and, you know, l- long may it continue really. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, that's quite interesting. It is one of those things that often you've just got to get your foot in the door in journalism. And then just once you've started writing, you can kind of sort of go on your own little tangents occasionally and indulge yourself in your own personal interests and uh, and loves and often i think as you say too many people want to dive in the deep end straight away rather than sort of take it slow and steady and get there but that i think that's the same for most aspects of life mark it, it is yes it is isn't it it's it's just it's just you know, get, get your foot in the door get started get going and you know if, if you've got to write about a local dispute about bins rather than your <laughs> local football team then so be it you know but that's that's what you're going to do to get started absolutely um in regards to the paranormal in Wales, I have to say one of my first exposures was, and I mention this often on my show, and I'm sure my listeners are probably fed up with me mentioning this show, was Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. Oh, yeah. And then they did the follow-up series, Mysterious Universe. And on one of those particular episodes, Mark, they did a, an episode on things that go bump in the night, some of the most notable poltergeist cases. And I was astounded to see an interview with a lady called Marcia Howells, who lived on Rhonda Street in Swansea in, 19, in the 1960s whose house had been smashed to pieces by a poltergeist. And I love poltergeist stories. They're my favourite part of the paranormal. I'm deeply interested in these particular incidents when it comes to the world of hauntings and ghosts, because they always seem to be a little bit different and a little bit stranger than just a, a spectre wandering around a house or a, or a certain location making strange noises or, or frightening passers-by, Mark. And I think it's one of those things that often... These stories can sometimes get lost in the annals of history. And yet, because not only was it widely reported in the newspapers at the time, they were also interviewed by ITV, I believe, at that point back in 1965. And there is a wonderful interview that's still available online, which I'll put in the show notes for this week's show for anybody that's not seen it with with Marcia. And she's clearly deeply upset. And we see the footage of everything and, and the police officers are saying, well, we've no idea what's going on. And it literally looked like a bomb had gone off in her front room. It was incredible. And yet it's one of those situations that those of a sceptical slant will say, oh, well, she probably did it herself. And you think, well, why would someone, especially as we were saying about the connections between where you are and where I am, I grew up, I've often thought that Yorkshire and and Wales are very similar because of our tradition and history in, in the coal mining industries. So there seems to be a, a kinship between us, I feel, um, in a in a sort of working class culture kind of way that we've we've very similar sort of surroundings and upbringings and uh, and the way that the areas have been over the years and the scarred landscapes that we share, I think. So I've often found that we seem to be far more similar than than we are different, despite the fact that we're completely different areas of the country. And when we look at situations like what happened to Marcia, I think people will dismiss it as, as superstitious nonsense. And yet these kind of situations are still going on in the modern era, Mark. And I think, as you touched on about your Victorian archives, there's a long history of this. And I think when we look at the history of the paranormal, I find it remarkable that some people just seem to dismiss it as, as old-fashioned superstition and nonsense when... For both of us, we grew up in areas and, and as I was saying in regards to Marcia and Swansea, these were people who were working class people whose possessions were, were hard earned and gained through nothing more than hard work. These weren't people who were in a position 
Mark, to be smashing up everything they owned just for some attention? Definitely not, no. And you, you mentioned that poltergeist incident in Ronda Street there. And if, if we speak again in a year's time, I'm going to know a heck of a lot more about that because th this is slightly top secret, but I'm working on my, my next book at the moment. And it is actually going to involve visiting that particular place nowadays uh, to see what's going on. Ah. Um, and th there's also, uh, again, I, I, apologies for being slightly vague with these two right now, but there's another one in Cardiff, which is very similar. And I'm almost going on a little poltergeist hunt that I'll, I'll, I'll know a lot more about next year. Um, but what, what you mentioned there about working class people not being able to smash up their stuff is, 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 is very interesting. And there's, there's one story in, um, in, in the Victorian archives books again that you mentioned where one man is so scared by what he encounters with this ghost that he is, he is convinced that he is going to die from the fright as, as a result of encountering this ghost. He is convinced he's going to die. Mm. And they record, he, he dictates his will to his friend because he thinks he's on his deathbed. And he dictates his will, and his will is his three most treasured possessions. This is all he has in the world. And they are his pipe, his tobacco pouch to go with it, and this little portrait he has of what he calls his sweetheart, his, his wife or girlfriend or wife to be maybe. And it, it's quite incredible that these people, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have Ferraris and big TVs. They, they, they had a pipe and little portraits and that's all they had. So they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be going around smashing this up, you know, if, if they were sound of mind, as they might say in the Victorian age then. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, th th there are lots of, possibilities out there for poltergeist activity it, it might or it might not be paranormal um but but i think i think someone doing it just for attention is 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 a bit weird and strangely um this one is probably um well you make of it what you will i'll tell tell you about it and then you can decide but that incident again in ronda street in swansea Derek Acora recorded uh, a television series called Ghost Towns. Yes. Um, I, it was quite soon after he was kicked or he, he left most haunted for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those episodes, he visited Swansea and he did he, he did this thing where he stopped at people's houses r rather than going to castles and things. He went to residential properties and did it, did his psychic thing inside there. And he did go to a house very nearby. I think it was the street above Ronda Street. Um, hmm. I'll have to check this, Mike. I, I, to be honest, I wasn't expecting to be talking about Derek Cora's ghost towns today. But uh, <laughs> neither was he, I. He was certainly <laughs> no, but he, he was in the Mount Pleasant area of Swansea, where hmm. where where that it, it took took place, and he investigated a very similar event. Um, and so maybe maybe there's something in that part of the world that is attracting poltergeists. May, maybe, of course, they they just read a similar story and thought we'll have the same. I don't know. That's not for me to hypothesize right now. But um, but yes, Ronda Street isn't alone in in having poltergeist activity. If uh, if you well if you believe Derek Gore's ghost town at least anyway. Now then, you you mentioned there the story from Cardiff. Is that regarding Pete? It is, yes. yes. <laughs> I love that story. Yes, yes. It, th th these are two stories because um, the, the the Swansea one's the 60s. Pete, I think, is Pete the 80s or 90s is a bit more recent. Yeah, I think it was 80s and 90s because I, I remember seeing a couple of the people that was involved because he was, a, was it a garage that this started to happen in? Yes, yeah, so it was certainly, um, I, again, it's somewhere I'm going to go to. And it, it was certainly um, a, a place of business then rather than a residential property. Yeah, because I remember one of them really, when he was being interviewed, it was almost as if he'd built up some kind of family relationship with this because they called him Pete. And I think it was supposed to be the the spirit of a, of a small boy. And, and, and it's typical poltergeist. Things were flying about. But... When I heard the people being interviewed about that, they seemed to be quite, they had a real kind of emotional attachment to this. They seemed to really like this little spirit, whatever it was, Mark. And it's one of the sweetest poltergeist cases. It's probably the nicest poltergeist case I can think of because they really seem to take, take this little thing to heart, whatever it was. Yes, yes. And l like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking myself now that I, I that we're, not, we're not doing this in a year's time when I've actually... D done more investigating and been there and spoken to people, but but yes, I mean I, I spoke to there was um, 
this is going off on a slight tangent, but it is connected. But there, there's a, there's a supposedly haunted pub in 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 Kenfig area of Bridgend in Wales called the Prince of Wales. Mm. And I was talking to the landlord there about it, and some of the activity is is you know it's, it's friendly enough. Some of it, he said, involves throwing objects at members of the kitchen staff, which sounds quite extreme. <laughs> but he he was telling me that he's had. Um, psychic people or people who, who claim to have psychic abilities and things have, have offered to go in there and to help him to move on these spirits. Uh, and he said that he doesn't want them to do that because he knows what he's dealing with now. They might be good. They might be bad. They might be, you know, they might fluctuate, but he knows what he's dealing with. And mm. he said, if you commit, get rid of these ghosts, who knows what's going to replace them? Mm. So maybe, maybe, maybe people are happy with what they've got and in, in some way, I don't know, learn, learn to live with them, learn, learn, learn to even like them, as, as it sounds with the case with Pete. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't worry about that. I, I will certainly probably be popping in to, to ask you to come back on in a year's time when the new book's out, because I love poltergeists, and especially those two particular cases are, are two of my favourite favourites in Britain. So, yeah, and, and, and any excuse to pop back on and talk, uh, talk more <laughs> ghosty things. And, and, and of course, to, I'll, pro- I'll probably be asked to, uh, to name drop my book a few times that <laughs> by the publisher when it's out as well. So uh, that, that'd be, kill, kill two birds with one stone then. Sounds good to me. So, as you touched on there, the Prince of Wales, we were going to look into, because Wales has a history of some notable haunted pups, and what I've often found odd is, as you mentioned there, the Prince of Wales is, is one notable location, which we'll, we'll come back to. One that seems to have developed a reputation as being a terrifyingly haunted location is the Skirred Mountain Inn in Monmouthshire, I think it is, Mark. Um, and yet, I read, first read about the Skirred as a as a child reading one of Peter Underwood's books and at that point I think he was in the 70s when he came the locals were said there wasn't much happening and if there was it was this friendly little spirit and it just seemed to be a pretty mundane pleasant little haunting that occasionally people might see something or whatever fast forward 40 years and it seems now that the Skirred is home to some rather nasty spirits so as a as a welshman mark are you surprised that we seem to have had this kind of development in this particular location i, I yes I, I am surprised it, it's something I, i've written about myself um and what what, what i do really need to stress with the scary before, before i go off on one <laughs> with this one uh, is that I, I absolutely love the Skirred Inn. I love going there. It's an incredible venue. And, you know, if anyone listening to this hasn't been there, I, I would strongly recommend going there to check it out. Mm. But the, the best comparison I can think of that people might know of outside of Wales is uh, Jamaica Inn, if you down in Cornwall. Yes. Which also has, the, which, again, I love. I want to stress, I love the Jamaica Inn as well. And it's somewhere I stayed um, just a couple of years ago. That also has this reputation for being incredibly haunted and come and stay in the haunted rooms and you'll see ghosts over there, left, right and centre, wherever there's ghosts around every corner, wherever you turn. Um, and, you know, and, and it's a great way of getting people in. But when you actually stop and look at you know, where, where these stories come from, that, that's when a few question marks pop up. And g- going back to the Skirred Inn, the Skirred Inn, if you believe all the ifs and buts, buts and maybes, it's the most incredible place in the world right now. It's it's the oldest pub in Wales, we're told. Now, this is based on the fact that it might be built on the foundations of another pub, which is really old. It's something, to, to the best of my knowledge, nobody can verify. So rather than saying it's the oldest pub, what we have to say is it's potentially the oldest pub if this pub that used to exist is really there, which we don't know if it is there. Another legend attached to it is that Owen Glyndur, you know, that's the last Welsh, uh, Welsh prince, native Welsh prince, uh, gathered his men there. And there's a plaque, I believe, saying you know, this, is, this is where he gathered his men. Again, that hasn't been proven historically, I don't think, whether or not Owen Glyndur was there. And the biggest, if but maybe about it, which changes the entire, I mean, the entire idea of the haunting for me, is that Judge Jeffries, the notorious Judge Jeffries, <laughs> was there hanging people left, right and centre. And, and if he wasn't hanging them, he was disfiguring them and people were, were killing themselves in terrible ways to escape his vengeance and things. <laughs> and these are the people said to be haunting the entire building now. And again, nobody knows if Judge Jeffries was there and if he was there, what he was doing there. And if he was there, how many people, if any, he killed. So 
they're wonderful stories, and if they're true, it's incredible. Um, but we just don't know what 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 we need is. And I've 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 mentioned this before. If I ever get the time, I would love to be able to to sit down and go through all the historical records and find out what's really going on. Hmm. Um, but but as things stand, it it sounds a little bit like um like people need to take a step back and actually work out where these where these stories come from yeah very true i think it it is one of those things we've got a couple of locations up here that seem to have developed over the last 30 years stocksbridge bypass is a very famous one mark which seems to have taken on a life of its own now where there are stories of children being killed in a mine accident or, or monks being killed for breaking their their vow of chastity and yet there's no historical record of either of those events at all um and those two events don't really bear resemblance to what was originally reported and now it's it seems to have developed into a into a life of its own ironically when we're talking about spirits um so that's one of those and all also, we also had a, a, a pub, which is no longer a pub anymore. It's now a, a Starbucks, which is called Carbrook Hall on the outskirts of Sheffield near uh, Meadow Hall, our shopping centre here. And um, that would always advertise itself as the most haunted pub in Sheffield. And back in the days, there used to be a pub sort of across the road from it that also used to advertise the fact that the only spirits they had were behind the bar, Mark. So they were basically yes. taking the Michael out of each other. Um, yes. <laughs> so... Yep. And that's one of those places where you, you kind of think, well, because where it was and it wasn't a particularly busy pub, was it simply sort of buying into this tradition of, of saying, well, we're very haunted? However, since it's become a Starbucks, apparently the incidents have started up again, which is quite interesting because now it's probably busier than it was when it was a pub because of the area it was. It was in, in a, a very industrial part of Sheffield that, Sadly, in the 80s, most of the business around it were, were knocked down and, and fell apart, Mark. So there was no trade for it, really, in that particular area. You, you kind of had to go out of your way to go there, even for a drink. So now it's probably busier as a Starbucks than it was as a pub. So it probably doesn't need to kind of indulge in these stories of the paranormal to to attract people there because people will go there anyway now because of what it is and and how it works so i often used to think and i'd been a couple of times and never saw anything or met anybody that they just kind of said oh well it, this this was supposed to it was you know tale of a tale as it were or you know it's always second hand and um now i'm sort of looking at it in a in a different kind of way because obviously Clearly, something is happening because now they are saying that things are going on in there. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's it's worth it's definitely worth investigating. And mm. I, I I think I mean what what I should I, I this is where I keep putting my foot in with the scare in. E even though I mentioned there, but you know, there's there's no evidence of this Judge Jeffries being there and things. Of course, that that doesn't mean that it's not haunted. It could still be incredibly haunted, just not by the stories that people think it is. You know, it just might not be these hanged people. And if if you follow that, then maybe. Maybe these ghosts that are there do cause more of a fuss and less of a fuss, depending on what's going on in the building. So, you know, following that trail of thought, maybe these ghosts are not happy with Starbucks being there at the moment, but mm. maybe they were perfectly happy with the previous owners and whatever they were doing. Um, you know, this is just top of my head stuff. Um, and, and who knows? Maybe it's a similar thing with, with the spirit. Maybe, maybe some some work has gone on there. Maybe something changed in the last few decades that has disturbed them in some way. And now they're unhappy. Now they're making a noise. And somebody has attached this story about people being hanged and the two have been conflated. Mm. Um, we, and we end up in this situation where there's a lot. It, it's a case of there's, with, with these things, there's a lot of, lot of nice theories, a lot, you know, lot of hypothesis and <laughs> if, buts and babies. Really, it takes someone who's got the time, really, and, and a bit of spare money to sit around doing this to, to, to really put the, the work in to find out what's really going on with these places. Um, and may, maybe there's a plan for retirement. Maybe when I've got my feet up, I can spend some time <laughs> really, you know, go, going, going around the country, looking at, uh, looking at all these places and these stories to try and work out why, why we get this spike in activity. Um, and, and, and if it is in some way attached to, uh, let's, let's say enterprising 
commercial ventures or whether or not it's paranormal. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's a valid point as well, that maybe it's changed because obviously the Skirid Inn had a history of a haunting because it's it's mentioned 40 odd years ago. So there's obviously a history of it, whatever it was. So it's not like it's suddenly become haunted. It's always had a haunted history. It just seems to have changed. And like you say, often we are told that renovations or a change of purpose can reignite something and maybe that's the same thing that's happened at Carp Recall so I think that's a whilst you can look at the historical record and kind of question the backstory we know enough about the paranormal to know that often any kind of change can sort of reignite situations so that's that seems a fair point um but as we were we started diving into the skirt by mentioning the Prince of Wales the Prince of Wales seems to be a really haunted location that's also quite modest about its haunting it's not sort of shouting from the rooftops about it and yet when you look at what's going on and you speak to the people who work there and and the people that go in there clearly there's a lot going on at the prince of wales it it is and this is a really good example of i I was talking earlier about you know being a journalist and being able to to go to these places Mm. If, if you go on the internet now and do a search for Prince of Wales ghosts and Prince of Wales, in, you know, in Wade Wales haunted, what, what you'll find is either my articles for, for websites like Wales Online or my books and things, because they don't shout about it, right? The, 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 these ghost stories depend on people, people like me <laughs> go in there, go in there and dig in and finding out. Now, I, I was lucky enough that, he, sadly, he's retired now, but the, the, the landlord at the time when I was going there, a l- lovely man called Gareth Mond, he, he'd been there a long time. He knew the previous landlords. He knew the stories. He knew all the tales. And I was able to get in, get the stories off him, film all the areas and all the locations he was telling me about before, mm. before he retired. Um, although, you know, he's still super keen about the place, and I'm sure he'd still help out if anyone did did want to uh, track him down for some reason. Yeah. But what, what really brought the Prince of Wales to my attention is that I, I grew up in Portal, but not far from the pub. And in the early 80s, the Prince of Wales became famous in places like America and Japan. People were, were traveling there. The BBC were down there with their sound equipment because this new at the time phenomena, this new paranormal phenomena, which people were calling the stone tape theory, Mm. had to be captured in the Prince of Wales. Now, of course, this sort of started in the in the early 70s and things. But the Prince of Wales, I think, was a really good early example of somebody capturing evidence of what they claimed was the stone tape theory. And that's because there was an old uh, banqueting hall, I believe, but this old hall above the pub that was locked off to the public. So downstairs, people go in drinking, and then you've got the rooms then for the landlord and people to sleep in, and then there's this old banqueting hall, whatever it was for, totally locked off. Mm. And in that room, people could hear the organ being played when it was closed. Um, and, and, you know, to cut, cut a long story short, it was the, the hypothesis was it is the stones replaying sounds of an organ from old... Sunday school services say so you know r- rather than rather than ghostly fingers in there pressing keys down it was more a case of the sounds were being played from from some some memory that it had recorded mm. um and it, it was never solved like like I said there are I, th- I think somewhere on YouTube there is an old video of, of one of the BBC investigations there it was never solved and as, as you mentioned they, they didn't shout about it they didn't milk it and it just it just died away if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, I, for some mad reason, this stuck in my head from my childhood, <laughs> when when I grew up then, I was able to go back as an adult and investigate it. Um, and, you know, as, as mentioned, there's there's a video out there I did from the place and there's there's articles and things. Um, but that is it, it's the flip side, really. It's the flip side of these what, what you'd call the celebrity haunted pubs then that all the TV series go to. Then you've got someone like the Prince of Wales, which is more of a hidden gem. It's more. It, it doesn't shout about it, but I think as if, if you're if you're interested in investigating these things, it's a much more rewarding place to go to. Mm. And it seems to be one of those places where the people that own it and work there are very comfortable with the situation. They are aware of what goes on, and they seem to just think take it as as part of their day to day life. Yes, well, I mentioned about um, Gareth earlier, you know, saying he doesn't want to move the ghosts on because he doesn't want you know he doesn't know what will replace them. Um, what, what, what I loved, he was telling me that he says, or he did before he left the pub, he used to say good night to them each night. <laughs> so as he, as he was shutting the pub and putting the lights off and putting the alarms on, <laughs> he'd say good night. 
and he called him his friends. Good night to his friends. <laughs> and then he went to bed. Um, and that was just, you know, his way of, you know, keep keeping them happy. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think he was particularly bothered himself. I, I don't think the kitchen staff having jugs thrown at them were too happy. But I think Gareth himself seemed happy enough about it. Um, but, but, you know, the, the activity there, if you go through it step by step, is, is it's, it's not it doesn't seem connected. It's not like it's all stone tape theory. You've got this stone tape angle in one room. But then you've got this other area which seems to be connected to the Second World War, and there's you know a ghostly woman and things in there. And then you've got this poltergeist activity in the kitchen, and you know th- there's just so much going on. It's you know it's it's yet another one of those places that needs to be needs to be investigated properly, really. Yeah, and it sounds very similar because there's there's another haunted pub that I'm aware of in in Wales, which is um, in Neath. Is it the Castle Inn? The Castle Inn, yes, yes. Which. Um, yeah, well, I was just going to say it's it's another place I'm very familiar with, really, because you know I put put Harbour, it's very close to Neath, um, so I pop back and forth there a lot. And um, r- regardless of the ghosts, it's also famous because it's where Richard Burton would take uh, Elizabeth Taylor when he was back in this part of the world. Oh, um, so it's the Richard Burton room as well. So it's got a bit of a, a celebrity uh, status as well. Fabulous, fabulous. One of my favourite actors. What a, a a legend that man was. The the very embodiment of larger than life. Yes, I've um. <laughs> going off on a tangent again. I've actually got a, a portrait of Richard Burton hanging on my living room right now, watching us as we speak. <laughs> well, <I'm... laughs> Richard, ne- next to him, Dylan Thomas. But that, 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 that's enough about my decoration. <laughs> <laughs> so, what else goes on at the castle other than it being a? Because, uh, like I say, it's one of those places where it's it's a guest house as well as a pub, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, and the, the castle. Um, uh, apologies if I have to paraphrase slightly here, because th- this story isn't particularly fresh in my mind. But one of the, the famous stories about the haunting at the castle is a Christmas one about a ghost that appears Christmas Eve. Mm. And it, it apparently likes to mess up the guest rooms in the, the rooms above the pub. And so the story goes, there's one night in the 1990s, I believe it was. Not not, not too late, you know, living memory. Mm. The, they, lock, they were locking up for Christmas and there was nobody in the pub for Christmas Day, you know, it was the one day everyone was off. And as they were closing, the, the two members of staff left in the pub downstairs could hear what sounded like footsteps or rustling upstairs. And when they went to investigate, they found all the lights on in all the rooms, all the doors wide open, as if somebody had been playing tricks. Mm. So they called the boss, um, you know, who was off, I'm assuming, enjoying his Christmas, but they called the boss in, uh, who came with his dog. And the boss and the dog went up to investigate. And what they discovered was that all those lights that had been switched back off again and all the doors that had been closed, it was back the way it was. Everything opened again, lights back on. And the dog, <laughs> this, is, this is why it isn't too fresh in my mind, the dog either goes crazy and starts running around all the rooms or does the opposite and whimpers and doesn't go near them. I've forgotten exact, exactly what uh, reaction mm. the dog has. But wh- whatever the dog's reaction is makes them think that, you know, this isn't, this isn't maybe of this earth. <laughs> Let's just leave it now and enjoy our Christmas. Mm. But it wasn't an isolated event. That This happened again a year later when the man locking up could hear things going on upstairs on Christmas Eve. And sadly, the, the, the man who was recording this, a man called Robert King, who is the expert on ghosts in Neath. I've, I've never known anyone to write so many ghost stories about one location. <laughs> um, sadly, he, he, he published his book then. Um, and when I spoke to him, you know, the, the pub changed hands and i think it was sitting idle for a while and things mm. so we don't really know if this continued but um certainly for a few years while while robert was writing this particular book that that was the the, the place to go for christmas time ghosts ah fantastic yeah it's i think these anniversary ghosts are quite an interesting aspect of the paranormal as well because there are some places that are quite notable for when these things are are still happening and when you've got something like that it would be interesting to see if it is still occurring, but as you say, because of the time of year, I would, you know, with the greatest respect, I would imagine people have more important things to do than go ghost hunting on Christmas Eve these days, Mark. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think 
I think you're more likely, if you happen to be living in Neath and out drinking on that particular <laughs> night, that maybe, maybe you might hang around to see if there's ghosts, but I don't think you do it the other way around and, uh, you know, get, 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 get the team together and go on, go on an outing. <laughs> I, th- I think uh, if, uh, I think if you're married or you've got kids, they might frown upon that when you disappear on Christmas to go look for ghosts. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you never know. You never know till you try. Let's we'll, we'll bear that in mind. I think. I mean, obviously, as we're talking about a pub called the the Castle Inn, Wales has hundreds of castles dotted across the country. I've yeah. visited a couple in my my younger days as a as a as a tourist there on the north, and, and obviously visited the beautiful Conway Castle. So. For anybody that loves the paranormal, castles are usually a, a, a perfect location. And, and I think often, because Wales has a, a long history and has castles built along the coastlines in, inland as well, Mark, it seems that not only do we have some of the castles that have been preserved and, and turned into tourist attractions, there are also notable locations where there are the remnants of what were castles. So... For you, is there any particular locations that you think, if anybody's visiting Wales and they want to take in a bit of history and maybe stumble across a, a spirit or two, which are the, probably the best castles to, to try and try your hand at uh, coming across something like that? Yes. Um, the, the, the castles thing is really interesting with Wales because the, the, there are so many. Um, and I, I think I, I think it's something like more square mi- more more castles per square mile than any other country in the world because mm. you know, there's, there's so many packed into such a small space. Yeah. What, what you've also got, and this is probably uh, a different question, there are a lot of places in Wales, I mean, as, as, as with England and the rest of Britain, there are a lot of places which are called castles, which are not castles, which feature heavily in ghost shows about Wales. So the two, two of the really famous ones are Margham Castle and Craigonorse Castle, which crop up again and again. Mm. Um, but they're, they're actually manor houses. But in the Victorian age, you know, the, the wealthy people like to call their posh houses <laughs> castles. You know, they're, they're, they're not castles in the sense that, you know, they were built for, you know, fighting off invaders like some of the more imported ones. Yeah. Um, uh, my particular castles, I, I think North Wales is probably the way to head to see the what what are known as sort of Edward's ring of castles, which which were built to sort of oppress the native the native Welsh people, which are connected with ghost stories. For me personally, there's one in the south that I've been able to actually spend a few nights at, which, which makes it it's probably not as impressive a castle as as you know as, as those in the north, but it's one I've got some really good experience with from being able to you know to sleep there, mm. um, and that is Oystermouth Castle in Swansea, mm. and. Oystermouth Castle is said to be haunted by a white lady, and and again, it's based on it's based on these you know historical stories that people have connected to to to, to sightings. Hmm. Um, one, one of the downsides for you know, but but in Ghost Hunters is that the best time to see her apparently is in the bad weather and in the rain. That's when people see her on the battlements, hmm. which. For a castle with no roof on, it's not really the best place to be in the rain. It's, it's, it's much better places to be than walking around catching a cold in, in this drafty old castle. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful place. And what, one thing that really stuck in my mind with Oystermouth, I remember one night we were there with um, um, a ghost hunting group. And we were doing this sort of recce beforehand. As, as the sun was sort of set in and before we went in to lock the gates or the, I know, the drawbridge or whatever it is for the night, uh, before we went in to lock that for the night, uh, we did a recce, and behind the castle, which I'd never been to, because it's not, it's it's off the beaten track, and it's not somewhere you would follow if you were just a tourist just going to see the castle. But we were sort of being a bit more in, in depth for this investigation, and we followed this trail, and we reached this point that looked like something out of a Dennis Wheatley book. It looked like someone had done some sort of big satanic sacrifice on the ground with fire and things. And it was one of the strangest things I'd ever seen. Now, we did also see things like cans of Strongbow about, which suggests, you know, it, it was probably local teenagers doing something silly. Mm. But at the same time, seeing this kind of this strange ritual with fire that somebody had been doing in a secret place behind this supposedly castle before going in there for the night uh, was quite, um, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't settle your nerves, put it that way then beforehand. <laughs> um but it's it's a wonderful place w- with a lot of history, Oystermouth, and that, that's one I'd recommend. And and I would also, I mean, I, like I said, they're not technically castles, but Margham Castle and Craigonorse Castle are two, you know, w- w- wonderful places 
e- even if they're pretending castles. Um, and I mean, and another another really good mock one from the point of view of a tourist. You, know, you mentioned people visiting is Castell Coch, which means the Red Castle, just outside of Cardiff. And I think I think most people visiting Wales would probably catch the train, say, into Cardiff city centre, where you've got Cardiff Castle. But then just outside is Castell Coch, and it's quite famous because people can see it. When you drive down the M4, you can see the turrets sticking out of this sort of ancient woodland. So it looks it looks like a fairy tale castle before you even get there. Mm. And when you arrive, it's another building that's been built on the ruins of an old castle. So it does, in a way, have that kind of connection to medieval times, even though it's been, you know, it's been fancied up in, with all these sort of Victorian bits of decoration on it now. Um, but that's another place that I think... Whether you'll see a ghost there or not is, you know, there's just as much chance, I guess, as, as many of these other places. But it does evoke that feeling of, I mean, the, the, they they were going for this sort of Victorian sense of that that Gothic revival of knights in armor and chivalry and things. And I think as you walk around, even if you don't see a ghost, I think you'll still have a uh, an experience then, uh, whether or not that's from the the art that's there or the or the spooky things, if that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, fabulous. Well, I, th- I think, like you say, because it's got so many locations of, of, of varying tradition and history, th- there's probably something for somebody, whatever they're after or whatever they're interested in. And it's nice that when you look at some of these older places that they seem to have been repurposed into galleries and historic tourist attractions. Mark, I think, as you were referring to at the beginning, because for some people, even though they've grown up in Wales, they may not know that much about their history and some of the legends and locations that that you would suspect more people would know about. They, they don't, and you know, it's it, it's something I, I say again and again, and something, and something you mentioned. You know, it, it is it's a case of shouting about it. Um, and I think things like the dragon, you know, we're, we're, the, the, there aren't many countries, there aren't many places in the world with a big dragon on your flag. You know, th- that is something I think. Wh- wh- why is there a dragon there? You know, how, how many Welsh people know why, why there's a dragon there? Why is there a connection with dragons? And that is something, you know, put a big dragon somewhere, it's going to look great. You know, how many people are going to go and see a big dragon in the middle of a country? <laughs> um, and, and that's, you know, that's just one example from, from the flag. So I, I think there's such such an opportunity to um, to make the most of it, and and the way the the, the way you know a, a, other places tend to milk it. I mean, a, a Ireland's a really good example where when Game of Thrones was filmed in Ireland, you know the, the the locations people were again flying from around the world to visit these locations and to go and walk around you know, the same steps that so and so from the Stark family family walked along you know on, on the TV, mm. um, and and that's that's the approach really you know that I think would. Not, not not just for tourism, but for the locals as well, just to let them know what's what's on their own doorstep, really. Very much. I think often we tend to look outward too much when often there is history and legend on our doorsteps. You know, I'm I'm guilty of that, Mark, myself, growing up where I grew up. And it's only sort of in later life that I've begun to appreciate the area I am. And obviously being a stone's throw from the Peak District and castles dotted alone around the country near me and and wonderful haunted locations of legend and and folklore and history and it's it's something i've really sort of been bitten by over the last three or four years that i've really gone to appreciate what's actually on my doorstep yes yeah there's so much there um it it, it goes back to being curious again just just you know just go out it's go out and explore isn't it go out and find things and i i think it's it's a it's a cliche, but you, you can't be just jumping in the car and just going on an adventure one day, you know. Mm. Just just w- w- one Sunday afternoon, don't you know? Just don't don't play computer games for two hours. Just drive off to the nearest random castle and have a look around. <laughs> um, and you know, who knows who knows what you're going to find. Um, and and you know, this has been I think particularly important with the way the world has been the last couple of years, where you know we haven't been able to go and explore. You know, exotic places. We've be, we've been stuck exploring local places, mm. and and that that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Wherever you are, you can find things that you never knew about, and you can, you know, you can go and look at them. And and weirdly, I mean, some of the legends in Wales actually came about in the 19th century or were popularised because, with the French Revolution going on, a lot of the sort of the wealthy English tourists were a bit wary of you know sail into France and go in that way because they, well, they didn't want their heads chopped off, say. So instead, they were looking a bit closer to home 
and they were exploring this strange little country next to them called Wales. And as a result, I mean, a lot of things that you associate with Wales, that the Welsh costume was popularized at this time because the tourists were coming in. They wanted to see something a bit different. Well, you know, put that big funny hat on and it looks great in the photos. <laughs> um, and, and then there are legends. I mean, well, a very famous legend in Wales is uh, Gallop the Dog. You know, again, this was popularized, so it's said, to bring in the tourists and the tourism money at the time. Mm. So it, it, it works both ways. It keeps the it keeps these traditions alive. And it helps support local businesses at the same time. It is remarkable sometimes because where I, where I live in Sheffield, we have um, a 16th century farmhouse called the Bishop's House, which is 20 minutes walk from where I'm sat talking to you now, Mark. I can near enough see it out of my window. And it's one of those places that, despite its history and its location, a lot of people have no idea what it is or where it is. And I find it crazy that even in a... You know, a major city in the UK, such as Sheffield, we have these hidden gems that are just seem to have been forgotten. And as you say, people tend to be looking outwards more. And I think over the last couple of years, because of everything we've all gone through and the situations we found ourselves in, a lot of people have kind of reconnected with their localities and the traditions and the history that they live amongst, rather than thinking about where outside of their local area they needed to go. And I think for some people, it seems to have been a real a real eye-opener that they've got so much on their doorsteps. De- de- definitely. It's something I've been doing, you know. Maybe maybe, maybe that's what Visit Wales should use, you know. Ne- ne- never mind uh, never mind Dubai. Come to Castell Cork. Come and look at these castles and have a look at them there. <laughs> it, it'll save you a couple of powdered flights and, you know, <laughs> slightly slightly less sun. Um, mm. But, but there, are, there, there is so much... Um, I mean, I mean, to, you know, to give you a little example, I mean, I, I was, I've got family who moved to Porth Call not so long ago. Mm. And, and so I thought, which is, you know, it's a little seaside town uh, on, on the south, south of Wales. And I thought, well, let's you know, do a little bit of investigating before I go there. And, and, and this one little town has got, you know, sacred springs and haunted pubs and all these other things, which, you know, I, I never would have thought of looking for, you know, had, had you know, um, uh, you know, th- these family connections hadn't emerged. Mm. And that's just one example of one small place. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what's out there. And, you know, thanks to the Internet, um, you know, you can probably like, like we mentioned earlier, there's probably there's probably too much information out there. There's probably too much that you can do now if you if you look into it. <laughs> I have to say, I'm glad to hear it's not just me, Mark, that whenever I hear of a location or, or people move somewhere, I'm I'm not the only one who's looking for the the historic folklore and ghosts of that particular area that they've moved to so i can kind of kill two birds with one stone yes yeah i'll always be curious uh, or, or nosy maybe is another way of putting it but yes i'll always be curious <laughs> uh, as you were to- as we were just briefly talking about castles and and mock castles that some of these manor houses that the owners decided that they wanted to be a bit grander than to the likes of us mark living in a manor house would be quite good enough and um, never mind pretending it's a castle and I've always been intrigued by a wonderful story from the from the end of the 19th century, which is about the opera singer Adelina Patti, who was one of the greatest singers in the world at that time and was fettered across the world and, and, and played to sold out audiences in America and across Europe, who fell in love with Wales and decided that due to her fame and fortune, she needed to be somewhere where she could indulge herself and get away from it all and just fell in love with the country and moved there didn't she she did i mean uh, the, the adelina patty 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 story is I'll, I'll get to the ghost stuff now but i think her life story is incredible in and of itself and mm. it, it, it's also great that it leads into a into a ghost story and i think it's really hard to to, to stress how huge she was i mean I'm, i mean i'm i'm, I'm an opera fan myself but i think most people even with no interest in opera have heard of the composer rossini who mm. composed some of the biggest operas he wrote an opera semi semi remedy uh, i'm probably oh, pretty mispronounced semi remedy um with adelina patti in mind rossini was writing operas for her verdi was a big fan and some of the biggest people in the world abraham lincoln invited her to the white house to go there and sing for him and Queen Victoria, apparently, who was mourning for Albert at the time, came out of mourning just to hear her voice to find out what the fuss was about. Right. So th- this is the impact Patty was having on the world at the time. Now, her personal life was a bit of a mess. And it was back in the days when, I guess, the paparazzi and things back in the early days when they were looking for, for stories about people. 
And she was caught in this scandal and she had to find somewhere to go and live with her second husband, a guy called uh, Ernesto, uh, Ernesto Nicolini. Mm. Um, I'm struggling with my pronunciation of my Italian names today. Uh, Ernesto Nicolini. And they had to find somewhere that was lavish enough for someone like Patty who had, you know, millions and billions and trillions of pounds. Mm. At the same time, it had to be off the beaten track because they wanted privacy for whatever they were getting up to. Uh, and they found this perfect spot in Wales, which is, is called Craigenors now, which means Stone of the Rock in English. Mm. And she really did transform it. You know, she, she called it a castle. It's, it's not. But, but the money she spent, she could have quite easily made a castle if she'd wanted. <laughs> uh, I mean, she, 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 she even built an opera house on it. You know, she went over the top totally. Yeah. And to, uh, to show how she changed the local area, she had people like the Prince of Wales come to visit her. And obviously the Prince of Wales couldn't be seen to be winding around the Welsh mountains on a horse or something. And so they had a train station built in next to a house for her. <laughs> so it's a royalty could jump on the train and go straight to her house and pop in. So yes, a fantastic <laughs> amount of money, fantastic property. And on top of all of that, it's haunted. Brilliant. <laughs> it is remarkable. It is essentially one of those stories. I think I'm often surprised that it's not more well known outside of that immediate area because she was dearly loved by the locals as well they were they seemed to be absolutely enamored that this superstar of of the arts had fallen in love with their their particular location she was adored wasn't she she was she was i mean e even though you know she she did have servants and things she treated them very well for you know the the standards of the day um I, I mentioned the opera house that she built, which is which is one of the places where people go looking for ghosts now. And she actually built an upper layer, which, which has been removed now for safety reasons, I think. But she built this upper layer so her servants could actually come to the concert. You'd have all, all the posh people downstairs in the seats. Mm. But her servants could come in and watch what was going on. <laughs> and then in the village, I mean, you know, I mentioned she built that train station. But of course, the, these additions were all helping the local people as well to have these things being built that are going on there. I mean, there's a huge building in, in Swansea now called the Patty Pavilion, which I think the last time I went, there was a big, huge curry house. But that Patty Pavilion was originally part of her property where she kept her exotic birds and things. And then when she died, it, it's been shifted and transformed into a giant curry house. So she really did a lot, a lot for the local area. Um, and it's also where she recorded because she was, she was in the early days of records being made. She died in the early 1900s. Mm. And so towards the end of her life, she did record some material, um, which was some of the first records to be to be released. And she recorded those in Kriegenos. And one of the ways Ghost Hunters try and communicate with her now is by playing those old recordings to her to see if they get a response. And one of the responses is because she recorded these when she was on, on her last legs, pretty much. Mm. She didn't sound that good. Um, she wasn't happy. Apparently, she cried because they sounded so bad um, because she'd never heard her own voice before because you know the technology didn't exist. Yeah. And, and so it's thought that by playing this, people are playing it to try and communicate with her by saying, you know, oh, it's your voice, it's your song. But she reacts quite violently because, you know, she, she hated that song. And mm. so by playing that to her in, in her death is just reminding her. Of, of how terrible she sounded at the end of her life or how terrible she thought she sounded at the end of her life. Yeah, that sounds kind of not the best way to try and attract something. So how long has these stories of Adelina's ghost been going on? Did it did they start once she'd passed on or was it one of those where it, it kind of took a while to get going, Mark? Well, what, what happened, uh, Kragnos has got quite a, dark isn't the right word, but after after she died, it did become a, a TB hospital for a while, mm. which meant uh, obviously it's the scene of, of, of suffering. Yes. Uh, and it also became a place for um, for elderly people, like like an old age type. I, I forget the, the correct terminology for, for it when it was being used. But it well, it to cut it short, it was the kind of place that a lot of people would have passed over then, yes. whether it be from sickness, whether it be from old age, for whatever it was being used for. Mm. Um, and at the end of all this period, it was left derelict for a while before it eventually became, you know, this, this, this wonderful ho hotel now. And it's the kind of place people go and have fairy tale weddings and things. But it was derelict for a little while after all these, you know, the, 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 the hospital scenes and things were going on there. And I think that is the time when these reports really started. But I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if people were seeing ghosts and things back then. But I think there was so much 
there was to be honest, there was so much real life horror going on. They, mm. they didn't need ghost stories to add to the, um, you know, the, the, the terrible things that were happening, I guess, uh, back back in the day. Yeah. Ah, I mean, well, yes, obviously. And it's it's very interesting that often we forget how prevalent tuberculosis was at that period. And I would imagine it was one of those places that was used because people were working on the presumption back in those days that fresh air and and great scenery was was good for the treatment of people that were suffering from TB. That that was yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know if that if that was the idea, but that would certainly make sense. Yes, because you know it's it's a lovely part in 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 the Swansea Valley. That you know it's a nice part of the world. They could go out and get some fresh air, or at, or at least have a nice view out of their window. I guess depending on how how bad they were. But um, yes, yes, it was. Um, it was well again actually that I mean it shows the size of the place doesn't it that um, you know she lived in a house they could transform into a TV hospital <laughs> this it, it, it's quite an epic quite an epic property to have and um, yes yes it's uh, but but you know as as mentioned it's 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 a much much happier place now although I did I, I don't know if you want me to tell you this quickly I think my 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 favorite personal paranormal experience did happen in Krakenos mm. uh, if you'd like to hear that story yes um, please. I, I was there with a, a friend of mine, a guy called Chris, uh, and we were filming a, a short documentary. And the documentary had nothing to do with ghosts. It was totally about uh, about the arts, about, about opera and things. And we were filming in the opera house I mentioned that she built. And underneath that opera house, she, she was one of the first people in the world to build a slanting floor that the the orchestra pit could go underneath and things. And it was a good way of for, for space and, and technical reasons. Yeah. But we were we were underneath the stage, underneath that floor, and I, I said to Chris, uh, oh, "Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Sorry, we were underneath there with the the cameras on us, and you know those big light bulbs they used to illuminate people that are being filmed in in dark places. Then mm. we had these 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 light bulbs trained on us, and they pressed record, and we, me and Chris were talking under, underneath. And I said to Chris before we started, I said, "Look, you do realize this is where they've seen the ghost of Adelina Patty." And as I said those words, those light bulbs that were lighting us exploded oh. and he jumped out of his skin, right? uh, as, as you would, I guess, at that time. Yeah. And, and it was almost like it was planned. <laughs> now, we looked into it and presumably it was dodgy electrics and we'd overloaded them in some way by having these powerful lights on there. Mm. Um, but, but I like to think that maybe, maybe we'd, uh, we'd also annoyed Paddy as well. <laughs> um, and maybe she was showing her displeasure by making the lights explode and making Chris uh, jump out of his skin. <laughs> sad, 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 sadly, he made the um, he, he made the cameraman delete the footage afterwards because he was so embarrassed. But that would have been a great little bit of, uh, <laughs> of real, possibly real paranormal activity to share on YouTube and with the world. Absolutely. I would not expect anything else from Adelina with her history of performance, Mark, that she would stoop to such a, a, a level of shock and awe for you guys. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think she didn't take any rubbish. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, before I let you go, there's one last thing I'd like to touch on, because obviously you also do this marvellous podcast that introduces us to the myths and legends and history of, of Wales, both paranormal and some of the traditions and, and folk history that perhaps most people wouldn't be aware of and i know on a recent episode you've covered the fabulous history of hugh clid who is known as the wizard of wales and often with stories like this people will say oh well it's probably just a an old wives tale or just one of those stories but this gentleman existed there is a historical record for him and what i found really interesting about this particular chap is that he was around at the time of King James and his self-proclaimed attempts to remove the scourge of witchcraft from across the United Kingdom and Ireland. He was obsessed with it, Mark. He was, some would say, he was more than obsessed. He was perhaps demented in regards to the way that he thought that witchcraft was a, was a real problem in the country at the time. And yet this chap had a reputation of, of being a healer and was able to kind of work without any kind of fear of reprisal, despite the fact that anybody else involved in witchcraft would be basically signing their own death sentence. Yes, yeah, he's, he's a fascinating character, and, and he's he's a really good example of the the kind of stories I like telling that 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 are almost certainly legendary in some parts, but at the same time are definitely rooted in reality. This this man existed. We know that. Mm. We know where he lived. We know what he did. 
And as you mentioned uh, with, with King James, he was the uh, he fought in King James's army. So, you know, he, he was clearly well known to people. And he was what, what I guess we'd call a wise man type character who could who could heal people and use his powers if he had powers, but use whatever he was doing to try and make people better. And I mean, I, I, as I mentioned on the podcast, I think my, my theories as to why he got away with it is, first of all, purely because he was a man. And there was, you know, it was a very, this attitude that, you know, witches, women, bad men, they, they can't be, you know, and not, not always, but I think, I think it was overlooked a bit because he was a man. Mm. Also, because at the time, what he was doing, things like curing people of, of, of fever and madness and things, the, these ailments in, in a deeply religious country, these ailments were thought to be sent by the devil or by demons. You know, it was the demon making somebody, uh, the devil, sorry, making somebody mad. Mm. And so if he could cure somebody of madness, he was driving out the devil, as it were. And so whatever he was doing, even though it wasn't it wasn't normal, it couldn't be evil because he's fighting evil. And so, you know, as, as, as sort of, I like to use the term, you know, he was using witchcraft to fight witchcraft. Mm. Um, and it sounds like one big contradiction. It, it is one big contradiction. <laughs> but yes, yes. I mean, they turned a blind, blind eye to him. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot, a lot of men of the cloth, really, a lot of men working for the church who are also what, 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 we, what we would describe as casting spells nowadays yes. um, it, it, to cure people. And, and they got away with it. And I think it's I mean, it, it's it's probably another example of the terrible injustice that was going on at the time where where women got blamed for this stuff. Mm. Men, men, men got praised for it. And in, in Floyd's case, he actually benefited financially from it. Yeah. Well, people would come from all over, wouldn't they, to come and see him and for, for cures and, and guidance and whatever. And it's it's very interesting that in this time of persecution, he seemed to be completely exempt from it all. It's remarkable, really, when you look at it in the historical context. He is, he is. And there's, like I said, there are so many examples of men like this in Wales. I mean, Hugh Floyd has become like a, like a Robin Hood kind of character where, you know, he's taken on a, a life of his own in a way. Yeah. Um, but there was a preacher there, the man called Reverend Edmund James, uh, Joe, Joe, I'm sorry, who collected the first, what, what is described as the first collection of Welsh ghost stories. Mm. And so many of those stories are about vicars and pre other other reverends out there you know going to sunday school teaching the kids how to do things and then casting spells afterwards and so i think there was something in the culture i think there was something that people people connected these these magical these magical things they saw going on with with god in some way they connected it with with, with something christian mm. rather than something evil and i think you know it, it, with, with Hugh's example you know he he is the the better known of them, but but I don't think it was it was uncommon. I think there was a lot of men doing it, and you know it's, it 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 is just a, an example of the terrible double standards of the day. Mm. Well, it's it's a remarkable story, and I think Wales has such a rich history that it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, Mark, and and diving into some of these locations and cases from around the country. Where can everybody keep up to date with your work, listen to your podcast, and get hold of a copy of your wonderful collections? Thank you very much. Thank you. This is, uh, well, uh, thank you for inviting me on, and thank you for giving me the chance to to shamelessly plug everything I've done at the end of it as well, Bob. (laughs) Um, Well, the podcast's the easy one that's available on all all the usual Apple, Spotify-type places. And it's called Ghosts and Folklore of Wales with Mark Race. The books are, I, I like to say they're available in all good bookshops. They're, they're certainly in all good bookshops in Wales. <laughs> Outs, outside of Wales, I think it's only really the kind of the, the London type waterstones that stock them. But they are, they're, they're available on all the, um, you know, the, 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 I, I don't like name dropping them, but the big obvious retailers online, you know who they are. They, yes. they, all, they all sell the books. <laughs> um, and if you search for Mark Reese, you can find them or fail in that. Mark Reese online is my website and that's got a list of them all with, with links to these online retailers that sell them. Brilliant. Well, I'll put links to everything in the show notes. Thank you for your time today and for te- giving us a, a, a guided tour of some of Wales's most haunted locations and some of the wonderful folklore and legends of the area it's been a real pleasure mark and hopefully we will speak again in the future obviously i know you've got your your next project in the pipeline and that sounds deeply interesting so hopefully we will get a chance to dive into that on its release thank you paul yes i appreciate it and if you do make it across the border or if anyone else wants to pint in the prince of wales with me and the ghosts let me know 
and we'll uh, we'll all meet up again uh, in, in the future. And yes, hopefully talk to you about Poltergeist uh, this time next year. Thank you, Mark. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye.